Today we're joined by uh, Buford Price, who's come down to us from UC Berkeley. Uh, Buford uh, got a BS in physics from Davidson <coughs> College and did his PhD at the University of Virginia. Uh, he then uh, conducted uh, a number of postdocs and Fulbright scholarships to the University of Bristol uh, and Cambridge University in the UK and also India. And then he worked uh, in uh, at Schenectady in uh, central New York. Uh, at GE for, for a while before getting a job uh, at UC Berkeley as a professor there. Uh, and uh, since then he's uh, held a variety of posts uh, and done a variety of research, a wide variety of research in, in his positions at uh, UC Berkeley, including uh, the director of the Space Science Laboratory from 1979 to 1985. And uh, he was Dean of Physical Sciences from 1992 to 2001 at Berkeley. Uh, Buford is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and he's uh, been an author or co-author on 518 papers uh, at last count. He's supervised 45 grad students, some of whom are in the room today. Uh, and he has uh, recently been uh, concentrating a lot of his efforts on neutrino detection uh, in the South Pole, including uh, working with the Amanda and the ongoing <coughs> ice cube studies uh, to uh, detect neutrinos at the South Pole. Uh, as a result of this, his uh, group has done a, a variety of research on dust detection in uh, the glacial South Pole deposits. Uh, and he is going to talk to us today about some work that he's been looking at uh, with, methanogen uh, with methanogens and microbes in the South Polar ice. So if you'll all join me in welcoming Buford. Thank you. It's really good to be here. <clears throat> I've got to get the right distance. I think I'm a little bit too close. Uh, I had uh, helped organize a conference about eight months ago in Rome, in the outskirts of Rome, uh, to try to understand what is producing the methane in the atmosphere of Mars. Uh, it was thought before this conference started that the lifetime of methane against ultraviolet uh, decomposition was about 300 years, and that is true. But there's another contribution to the lifetime that's not as well understood yet, which shortens the net lifetime to somewhere between a month and a few months. So something has got to be producing methane, methane at a fairly substantial rate. And there are only two possibilities. Either it's made by microbes or it isn't. <laughs> <coughs> and the isn't. Uh, there is a, a good example of how one can uh, uh, explain methane coming out of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, for example, by abiotic processes called serpentinization. Uh, then I got interested, after that meeting was over, in, uh, I'll, I'll tell you in great detail, in fact, uh, what that led me to, but I switched from one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, bacterium, uh, archaea, methanogens, on Earth to another candidate, which is cyanobacteria, which uh, may be just as old as methanogens. So I'm interested in the old stuff, and I'm also interested in what can happen in ice. Can life arise? Could life originate in ice? And can it live uh, for a long time in ice? First of all, now this, uh, this topic requires you to either know or be willing to consult a chemistry book and a biology book and a physics book in order to kind of, and a geology book, in order to piece together all of the components of this talk. And the first thing to understand is the phase diagram, which is never taught in physics departments. Uh, and in fact, I've asked biology and chemistry students, and none of the undergraduate students that I've talked with has ever heard of binary phase diagrams either, but they're absolutely essential to understanding how microbes can survive uh, in crevices in ice. A eutectic compound is one that has a V-shaped uh, 
plot of temperature at the liquid uh, 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 solid ice phase as a function of composition of the non-water compound. So this is zero magnesium perchlorate. And way over here is 100% magnesium perchlorate. Ah, pointer, OK. Sorry, you can blaze Oh, OK. Yeah, and this, show, this shoots way up here at 100% to about uh, 409 Kelvin. The point is that anything that has a eutectic, you can find uh, at a temperature above this some composition uh, in which there is plenty of liquid there. And uh, people who live in Schenectady, where I grew up, or rather why, where, where I went to um, a General Electric Research Laboratory, shovel salt onto their sidewalks to make them less slippery. And that's an example of a eutectic consisting of sodium chloride and water. And it, it melts down to minus uh, uh, 22 Celsius. Below that, it doesn't work. OK, now this is one of the things that I got interested in where can microbes live uh, in solid ice? They had just about been discovered uh, in, in ice. And uh, it wasn't clear. I did this work 10 years ago. It wasn't clear whether they were alive or dead. But I argued that they're alive and that uh, ice, which is polycrystalline, has a very unusual property that it rejects almost all impurities into the boundaries between grains. And uh, after the growth of some crystals and shrinkage of others with the passage of time, uh, not only is there these impurities at, uh, at two faces, but at three, uh, th three junction boundaries, which I have cartooned here. Of course, ap approximating by some perfect solid dodeca dodecahedron. Uh, and the uh, amount of impurities and the temperature will govern with a simple equation the diameter of one of these little liquid racetracks. If microbes, microbes manage to find their way there, uh, then they get water. They get bioelements, because there are plenty of uh, ions that have carbon and phosphorus and iron in them. Um, and they get energy from redox reactions. That was, uh, in, in principle, the case. Well, since then, people have used cryotomography to slice thin layers in polycrystalline ice and look in uh, SEM and transmission electron microscopy. And in fact, the veins are just typically loaded with microbes because they're nowhere else in, the, in all of the solid phase. They're just in the liquid phase. This isn't always the case. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of other scenarios that I'll mention, all of which work. Uh, one is microbes love to be on something solid. They like to be on sea sediment. They like to be uh, on clay grains, for example. I don't see it anymore. Ah, here we go. So here's an example of a clay grain, which is neat because microbes here can access iron that's deep inside by an electron transport uh, mechanism called shuttling. Um, and that provides plenty of energy. Here are some um, micrographs showing you examples of of microbes on grains. And this one I really like. If none of the above work, and you just put them into solid ice, um, they, providing they adjust to that temperature, they can just sit and wait. And here's an aerobe in close proximity to an a uh, anaerobe, an archaea, a methanogen. And ions, as long as they're not too big, can diffuse through the ice randomly until they reach the surface, which is coated with a couple of monolayers of liquid water. And so you may have a CH4 here encountering an, uh, an O2. Uh, over here, you've got other reactions. And the reason that they can coexist is that as long as there's an incredibly low concentration of oxygen, an archaea can survive. It's got various uh, enzymes that can keep it alive. OK, now here's one more. Uh, physics slash chemistry plot. This shows that there is an unfrozen water fraction as a function of the cooling, the depression of the freezing temperature, which all the way out to, I think, the lowest temperature where this um, 
issue has been uh, studied is minus 140 Celsius, and there's still a monolayer or two of unfrozen water there. Now, basalt uh, has, the, has the least amount of unfrozen water. It's just, it's really solid. There's no such thing as, as layers on it. And all of these other graphs have to do with different kinds of clay-like minerals. OK, now I've talked about how once microbes uh, are created, they can survive in ice. Uh, there's even a, the possibility of going a step further and saying that there's an alternative to uh, a warm origin in uh, deep sea vents, and that would be an icy origin on Earth. Uh, there are several arguments in favor of this, and uh, I really think it's a neat idea. I'll tell you one or two of the reasons why uh, there's an advantage to uh, bioelements uh, combining, compounds combining, until eventually you get amino acids and proteins. Uh, one of them is that if you have a, a thin film of, of unfrozen water, which I just showed you a minute ago, uh, it avoids, avoids the problem that uh, in a dilute ocean with uh, a, a very low concentration of, I mean, of um, the compounds that, that uh, uh, build up to form amino acids and proteins, uh, the reaction tends to go in the other direction for them to decompose. In ice, uh, the activity, the water activity, is so low that once the compound sticks, uh, it, it waits and uh, other compounds can join onto it and gradually polymerize into a very large chain. Now, Stanley Miller, who is one of my heroes, he died just a couple of years ago. Remember uh, the famous experiment of Miller and Urey. Uh, he has been his whole career at UC San Diego at Scripps. And uh, 27 years from when he published this paper I'm going to mention to you, uh, he and a student put ammonium uh, cyanide uh, into a freezer with dry ice at minus 78 degrees and came back 27 years later. And it was brown. Why was it brown? If you were to look, and he didn't, but if you were to look uh, in an optical microscope, you would see that all of the brown was concentrated into those liquid veins that I showed you earlier. And that is where the reactions take place on little racetracks that convert a three-dimensional random walk problem in an ocean into a racetrack, a one-dimensional problem in which microbes moving along this very narrow vein have a very high probability of encountering each other and sticking together. Um, and he, in fact, he found that the brown contained pyrimidines, purines, glycine, one of the amino acids. Um, so that was a great surprise to people. Then there's another thing where you image with uh, uh, entering a fluorescent dye and you, uh, this guy kind of, uh, I think, Kind of Variotti works with David uh, Diemer at UC uh, Santa Cruz. At any rate, he managed to get up to 11 bases, um, but that's nothing. A guy who was a chancellor at one of the North German universities and a, a fan of sailing took a whole year off from being chancellor, and he played around with cycling of ammonium cyanide uh, between, in sterile sea ice between minus 7 and minus 24 for one year. And in the end, he found that he had made 420 uh, bases. Um, OK, there are, uh, there are a few arguments, uh, uh, additional arguments as to why uh, uh, cold origin is, is very attractive. And that is that if you were to do the um, uh, Arrhenius plot as a function of temperature, looking at the survival rate of bases and amino acids, you would find that at temperatures above about zero, certainly above uh, uh, 50 degrees Celsius, the lifetime of these bases against decomposition is less than a year. So they've got, if, if uh, you insist on a hot origin, they've got to uh, uh, synthesize life very fast. Now I'm going to jump from this little introduction about why I like microbes in ice to the Mars meeting um, less than a year ago. And here's just a delta G plot as a function of concentration of hydrogen. And we see that there are constraints on Mars or in, in Mars uh, 
on uh, whether you can make uh, methanogens. Let's look at the green dashed line, which is delta G as a function of log concentration. And at for a, a hydrogen concentration on Mars, which is about 10 to the minus 8.4 moles, the green line shows you that at zero degrees, there is, oh, here it is, OK. Uh, and taking into account some uh, uh, energy that's necessary to exceed this, this um, zero uh, condition, uh, as long as the temperature is below about minus 10, then the uh, reaction should go uh, to make methane. And, um, uh, and to, to uh, have, have the redox reaction uh, produce methanogenesis. That's not a severe uh, problem, because there's, there's that much hydrogen, and there's certainly plenty of uh, places in Mars where it's cold. OK, now I want to show you that microbes are alive in ice. And I'll give you two examples, which are somewhat indirect, but for physicists, they're satisfactory. A biologist has to see it in a microscope. But uh, the physicist is, is quite happy, I think, with this argument. Uh, we take the top line is from Ed Brook, a geochemist who measures methane as a function of depth. In Greenland ice, I'm showing you data, three kilometers down in ice. And it wobbles around with little ups and downs that vary with the Earth's climate. But then, down near the bottom, in the bottom uh, 100 meters, you've got three outliers, which he brushed aside. Uh, right here, the concentration is one order of magnitude higher than in the Earth's atmosphere. How did it get there? This is only a factor of uh, maybe 1.5. And here's another order of magnitude. And what we found by looking at ice at these various depths is that there's a huge excess of microbes, in fact, methanogens, that made that argon in situ. I'm sorry, that made that um, uh, methane in situ. So they were alive at least for this lifetime at 3,040 uh, uh, meters. The estimated time that they were doing this was a couple of hundred thousand years. So they, they were alive, some fraction of them, enough to make this uh, excess methane. Well, uh, in fact, Nathan Bremel, a former student of mine who's sitting over there, uh, did some of this work. The cell concentration of all cells also peaked at those three depths. And the autofluorescence in the yellow-green compound called F420, uh, which is unique to methanogens, also peaked, whopping peaks at, at A and C, and not really a peak at, at B. At any rate, what we have in this graph is evidence for ongoing um, uh, meta uh, metabolism uh, by methanogens and non-methanogens. Uh, it's only about uh, minus 10. Yeah, but um, uh, the next one is, uh, we, well, we've seen it down to minus 40, evidence for, uh, for uh, uh, metabolism. OK, now this is one of the uh, instruments that Nathan Bramall and more, more recent student uh, Robert Rode and Ryan Bay, my longstanding collaborator who's wearing that brown suit, uh, developed. We had wanted to put. Uh, a logging instrument that would detect microbes and sink it all the way down and in real time read out the fluorescence to, as a measure of concentration of microbes. And the problem is that almost all boreholes contain organic fluid to keep them from uh, uh, slumping. So that didn't work. It just wiped out our signal. We're looking for non, uh, for autofluorescence. And there are a few examples of that. I mentioned F420, which is a signal of uh, methanogens. But the um, most common is tryptophan, which all of us contain in our bodies, um, and chlorophyll, which is incredibly bright. So we uh, concentrated uh, one version of our instrument not to go down into a borehole, but to keep in a lab at minus 20, minus 25, and pass ice through it, which had been brought up with a coring device. And the, uh, the laboratory at the uh, National Ice Core Laboratory in Denver 
has nearly 20,000 meters of ice from all over the world. So here's an example of one which has been sliced this way. This is toward uh, the Earth's surface, and this is toward uh, bedrock. So we have a 224 uh, nanometer laser pointing down. Now that's quite deep ultraviolet. And around it are seven photon counters that are picking off different crude uh, values for spectra of chlorophyll and tryptophan. Um, OK, with that instrument, we were able to take, now we're jumping from methane, from methanogens, producing excesses of methane in deep ice, to nitrifiers and denitrifiers, another type of uh, bacteria that emit N2O, nitrous oxide. The Earth's atmosphere has a few hundred parts per billion of uh, nitrous oxide, and it goes up and down smoothly with uh, changes of the Earth's climate. Uh, and if we compare the, this curve with somebody else's curve, which is for methane, you find that this generally tends not to have any big spikes in it, and this one does. And he only measured about one every uh, 15 meters, uh, the nitrous oxide. So there may be a lot more examples than this. But what we did was to look with the, uh, the uh, uh, fl uh, fluorimeter at meter after meter of ice. And we found that at every one, <coughs> sorry, well, we didn't get to that one. But every one of the uh, depths marked with a purple arrow, there was an excess of microbes as indicated by the tryptophan excess. So here are two examples of microbes being able to live. You wouldn't see it down here at zero because they've only been in the ice near the surface for hundreds to a few thousand years. You wouldn't see it against the uh, fluctuations. But as you go deeper, uh, where you're getting up to uh, 50,000, 60, 70,000 years, uh, it clearly stands out as evidence for in situ metabolism. Now this is, it's gotten to be more complicated as I keep adding new ideas to it. Uh, but it was something that uh, I worked on several years ago. It came out in 2004. And we start with um, a literature search of published data on communities of microbes that you can average over an individual species which has a bell-shaped curve that give you, gives you the optimum uh, uh, me metabolic rate. Uh, this, so this is for communities, and you find it fits nicely along an exponential with 100 kilocalories per mole, uh, sorry, 100 kilojoules per mole slope, uh, the usual plot of uh, 1 over Kelvin temperature. And three orders of magnitude lower, we found collections of data in which the petri, petri dish was too small to let them keep uh, growing exponentially for a long time. The ocean in the summertime, uh, they were competing with each other. And so they, they were uh, far down below the metabolic rate that they might have had uh, in a very dilute solution. And then another three orders of magnitude. Look at the red line. That is where we took the data that I've, I showed you a few minutes ago for um, methane and nitrous oxide and the temperatures where we, uh, and knowing the age of the ice and assuming half or doesn't matter much, 100% of the microbes are still alive, uh, you take is a very simple relationship between temperature, microbial concentration, which has to be measured, mass of the uh, micro, uh, approximate mass of the microbe, and the amount of gas that sticks out above the atmospheric background. And you get all these points here. So this then is dropping three orders of magnitude because the, uh, the microbes are, are stuck. Uh, they can't reproduce. There's no room. Uh, they, can't, they, don't use any, they don't need any energy and don't have enough uh, energy at this low temperature uh, to be able to uh, what, do all the things that microbes would like to do. It turns out that the brown lines are extrapolations from laboratory temperatures, say 150 or 200 degrees Celsius, of the rate of spontaneous uh, amino acid racemizations, that, that is the uh, conversion from uh, 
all of one chirality to a, a, an equal mix, this one. And within a factor of two or three, the same uh, value for the rate of uh, destruction of DNA by depurination. So I speculated that there's, uh, a, ju there's a, uh, a reason for this agreement. And that is that the uh, uh, amount of energy that the microbes at this very low temperature have if they're stuck in prison in a vein or something uh, is just enough to keep alive by repairing uh, the racemization and the uh, DNA damage. It's, it's just a coincidence, but I, I think it has some truth to it. Now, the blue is less than a week old. And I'll tell you what I think uh, we may be able to do, and it has to do with quantitative um, genomics and uh, uh, mutation rates in ice. And I'll, uh, I'll devote a lot of time to that subject. I'll just show you that We've gone from here to here is three orders of magnitude, to here is another three orders of magnitude. From here it looks like maybe another four orders of magnitude. And the mutation rate, fortunately for humans and for animals and microbes, is very much lower than the uh, uh, rates of these processes. That is, these can all, uh, as long as the organism has enough energy, they can be repaired with an efficiency of 0.999. So you take another factor of 1,000, if you read Bruce Albert's et al. Uh, book on biology, he estimates a typical a failure of repair to be only about uh, one uh, chain break or racemization in 1,000. So we're going to test uh, this in a few minutes. OK, so let's read this text. What about Mars? Uh, in Mars, a microbe is hardly likely to survive a few million years if it's within two meters of the surface because of the phenomenon known as gardening by micrometeorite collisions, which stir it up. And so if a microbe ever spends a day or two right on the very surface uh, of the soil, the ultraviolet is going to probably kill it. Uh, now, the, the other limitation is that if the microbe is sitting on any kind of inorganic grain, like clay, there's typically a, a part per million or so of both uranium and thorium present. They emit alpha particles. And it may seem like a ridiculously small problem to worry about waiting for alpha decay of one atom. But if you add it all up, you find that they're limited, according to my estimate, to no more than a million years for destruction if they're right on a clay grain. Uh, so they've got to be between the surface and clay grains, um, preferably in pure ice, which doesn't have the uh, impurities of uranium and thorium in it. Now, this is just one example. We have an under-constrained uh, problem here. There's uh, three variables and only two uh, ways to measure uh, phenomena to constrain them. Um, if we take the average observed, and, and admittedly somewhat still under debate, 10 parts per billion of methane um, averaged over summer and winter in, in Mars. And in fact, it's even, I mentioned the one month uh, survival against some kind of uh, reactive oxidizing species, which I think is probably the, the candidate that's worse for, mi for microbes than the, the solar ultraviolet. So we, we put them two meters down or, or deeper. We pick uh, uh, an equatorial uh, location at zero degrees, just to do the calculation. And we take the metabolic rate, which I showed you a, min uh, a minute ago in that complicated graph with all the lines in it. We get about 10 to the minus 9 grams of carbon per gram of carbon per hour. And for 40 femtograms um, of carbon per cell, then you need about one cell per gram in, of methanogens in Mars ice in order to account for the methane, which is, uh, has got to be replenished. One cell per gram is an easy number to remember. It's also very, very difficult for a person to either 
take an instrument up there and find a low con a concentration that low or bring these cells back and search for them. Uh, now going back to the uh, BFS, this Berkeley fluorescent spectrometer, uh, this is a set of systematic measurements which is far more detailed than I've shown you here. In order to avoid immense clutter, each point represents the average of about 1,400 measurements of tryptophan here and um, chlorophyll there. And then now it looks much, much tidier. And the interesting thing is that for about seven different parts of Antarctica and Greenland, they're fairly nicely bunched. So there, there seems to be uh, a reasonable f flux that's not varying a huge amount from uh, parts of Greenland to each other and around Antarctica and even between Greenland and uh, Antarctica. Now, this is where the biologist insists, uh, how do you know that this chlorophyll isn't coming from some leaves or from something else? Prove that it comes from microbes. And so that's when we started the uh, work that, that I'll talk about that we've been doing in the last six months or so. And in one title of this talk, which I forgot about, um, I call this the mystery of the microbial dark matter. And the reason I called it dark matter <coughs> is that when we melted the ice and started looking in epifluorescence microscopy for the little red, cell, uh, reddish emitting cells, chlorophyll emits in the red when you excite it in the blue, um, we didn't find any of those cells. Nothing that indicated chlorophyll. If you stained the cells, and I think I've got a picture here. No, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, at any rate, on the theme of uh, the microbial dark matter, they were missing. Whatever was producing the chlorophyll might or might not be cells, but whatever it was, they were incapable of autofluorescing uh, after having been released from their prison in the ice and, and left in water. Now, one of the problems is that these cells uh, in the ocean that are phototrophs have very delicate walls, and when you take them out of their comfortable prison in which they were in the ocean and had an odd osmotic uh, pressure that was adapted for them to survive, and then you melt the ice and end up with a pool of water, uh, the cells may burst. That was one hypothesis. But then you look closely. You stretch some of our uh, uh, fluorescence data. This is one year from here to here. And you look at the detailed points as we scan the uh, fluorimeter along. And you find a periodicity in both the chlorophyll and weaker in the tryptophan itself. There and here, the, um, the chlorophyll is, is red. And when you try to figure what's, what's going on, you realize if you look at ocean color satellite data for a decade. The peaks are in the Antarctic January, which is summertime, where there's a bloom, lots of chlorophyll. So this is a measure of chlorophyll. And if you look uh, at our ice and compare the red curves with the black curves, the red curves are from an adjacent location in the ice where we have chlorophyll here and we have non-sea salt sulfate, which is a result of uh, algae and other uh, uh, phototrophs uh, in the, on the ice. When the ice starts to melt in the, the uh, uh, summertime, uh, the, the daylight is continuous. You have a spike there. And it agrees in phase with our spikes of chlorophyll. So this is an argument to conclude that there were phototrophs in there. Now the next step is, how did they get into the ice? Uh, well, chlorophyll, the compound itself, disintegrates very quickly in sunlight, in air. So we argue that these are probably safe enough over a period of a few days to make it from a splashed wave of slimy stuff on the surface a few thousand kilometers into the top of the ice cap, where they're then buried with snow and compressed into ice. Same is true of the Arctic. Here the phase is July is the uh, peak. July, July, July. Um, so there's evidence for uh, phototrophs uh, that, that bloom in the local summertime at both poles. Now, I don't think we need to worry about 
Uh, well, we do have to worry about it. Can you see anything here? <laughs> this is uh, an example of what happens and why I call this the microbial dark matter problem. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. You look here, uh, there's only one red dot that could possibly be um, a phototroph. And where are they? If you calculate from our data with the fluorimeter, there should be dozens. So what's happened to them? And then I started looking in the literature. And uh, going back about 25 or 30 years ago, Sally Chisholm at MIT um, took a shipboard flow cytometer on a cruise. I'm going to tell you about the flow cytometer, which I just love. It's a wonderful instrument. Many of you know about it, uh, perhaps. Uh, but she had tried in a microscope to find the cyanobacteria, and they were dis the, the red was fading. Nowadays, you've got image intensification techniques and r rapid exposure, so you can see them. Uh, but we didn't at Berkeley have, uh, where I was working, uh, that uh, convenient technique. So it's dark matter. Um, so we moved from, after counting these concentrations of the non-phototrophs, we moved to flow cytometry. Uh, and this is just a, a wonderful instrument. This is a, an example of how it works. It's, it's about a $200,000 instrument. Uh, it may have as many as five different laser beams at different wavelengths that are, in, that are coming along here. You push the uh, solution, which can, contains your microbes, so reds and greens and blacks and whatnot. So it's flowing at a certain rate down here and uh, down into wastage. And the argon beam, uh, sorry, the laser beam, which has 488 uh, nanometer wavelength for argon, may be here. And there's another one at 500-ish, 600-ish. You may have as many as five different colors. And then we now look at the output. So here's an example. One laser hitting the cell. You can get uh, forward scattering. You can get side scattering. Uh, and all of those different colors. If you know me theory, scattering theory, uh, or else just go to Google and look it up in a table, uh, you can work out what the um, relative intensity should be at various angles um, as a function of the ratio of the size, assuming a sphere, the size of the cell to the wavelength of light. It, we're way out of the Rayleigh uh, uh, regime. Rayleigh scattering is, is uh, analytic. It's very, very simple. Uh, but it doesn't work because all of the cells are of order a micron or less, and the wavelength of the laser light is of order a micron or less. So here's our first evidence that they're really there. They're not microbial dark matter. And in fact, they have the same flow cytometric intensities as cultures do from three different locations. There is um, phototrophs that live in the top 10 meters or so of the oceans. And it was said until we did our work uh, that they, were, they loved warm, warm ocean. So Sargasso Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, you find them in great abundance there. In fact, they're enormously abundant. Um, and they, together with the, uh, uh, their cousins, the Sinecococcus, produce as much as half of the oxygen on Earth. So half the oxygen in this room is coming from those two species, indirectly. So here's. Are they only found in glacial ice? Are they only no, 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 no. They're very rare in glacial ice because you have to transport them from the ocean where they're just 10 to the 5 cells per, per milliliter. And some small fraction gets into the ice, as few as 10 cells per milliliter, or 100 or a few hundred if you're lucky. But we're able to, uh, with the flow cytometer, we can handle that. Um, I think it's an amazing uh, coincidence that I'll show you in just a minute that both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, you get the same kinds of signals. Of the, of the t what that just says is that whoever said that they were confined to plus or minus 40 degrees latitude uh, didn't bother to go to lower abundance where they're rarer uh, and in fact, as, as we're, we're finding, 
uh, we, we go all the way up to the edge of Greenland and all the way down to the edge of Antarctica and see them. But what we can't do yet is to go back from the counts of cells in the melted ice and tell you how, what that corresponds to in terms of ocean concentration. OK, so uh, here is a plot of red fluorescence versus orange fluorescence. And the prochlorococcus is mostly, well, it's about half a micron in diameter, a sphere. It's mostly got the chlorophyll, so it's up from the zero axis here to this little region here. The yellow means a huge intensity. So box R13, which is shown everywhere here, um, is the signature of prochlorococcus. Some uh, phycoerythrin, another uh, fluor. Uh, and then the second species, Senecococcus, is typically about 10% is abundant in the ocean. But we find, in fact, quite a bit in the ice. And you see that huge concentration with the, uh, the blue, the yellow, and the red in the upper right. So somewhere along that line, you can see some cells streaming off to the upper right there. And here, there's only four cells there. Uh, a few there, and so forth. Now, there's, there's a lot more that I would have to tell you to convince you, but this simply says that the pattern is suggestive of the ratio of chlorophyll to uh, phycoerythrin, which is the two major dyes, major um, uh, uh, fluors in the um, prochlorococcus and synecococcus. So now, let's. Uh, zero in. This is Sipel Dome in the West Antarctic. Uh, and there should be a lot of cells there because it's at lower elevation than the peak in Greenland, which is at several thousand meters, and uh, the highest elevation in Antarctica. It's close to the ocean, and it's somewhat a shallower elevation. So now I've, it looks like the colors you may not uh, be able to resolve completely. But uh, there's a, everything in blue there. I'm suggesting maybe a strain of the Seneca caucus, which follows this line uh, to the upper right, which is low light adapted because it's got a lot more chlorophyll and phycoerythrin. And the red is the uh, Seneca caucus that lives deeper, where it has, um, I got it backwards. Uh, it's got less chlorophyll living clo very close to the surface. And then these are the extremely abundant prochlorococcus in the Sipel Dome site. Now the coloring, uh, you can, uh, with this instrument, you can gate, you can put uh, a, a box or a circle or something around a grouping. And it will display in some other plot, which in this case, I've shown chlorophyll versus size, indicated by side scatter. And so the Small size, the prochlorococcus, falls here. The highlight synecococcus falls here. It's a, it's a bigger size and uh, uh, larger side scatter. And then the blue is pinned all the way in the upper right, right along that band. And I would have to lower the gain in order to move uh, enough to see, in, in fact, the detailed uh, distribution of those points. Before I leave this slide, I'll just point to somebody who was able, with a uh, more sophisticated optical microscope, to image some cells of Synecococcus here and the Prochlorococcus here. Now, you can't tell the difference, in can I, and I can't either, between this color and that color. But this is supposed to be a little bit more orange uh, than, than these. And these are bigger than those. Now, here is the uh, ground truth. Um, so the, uh, the top two is chlorophyll versus phycoerythrin with the uh, prochlorococcus uh, in the blue, the blue dots. And over here is the side scatter uh, for that, that grouping. And that side scatter corresponds. And one needs to know an absolute value for what these units refer to. And so people sell beads of different diameters. Uh, that can help you to calibrate. So the set of beads that I haven't shown you here, this is about half a micron. It agrees perfectly. And this is over in here, it's about one micron. 
All right, so we've got, this is the um, shallow ocean uh, culture of Prochlorococcus. Not 100% pure uh, because there's diffusion. And you can see that all those red dots are probably, though maybe there are one or two orders of magnitude fewer than, than the Prochlorococcus. They're probably a mix of some Synecococcus. And here, the situation is reversed. You're looking at deeper ocean where the cells have more chlorophyll. Uh, they, need, they need it um, uh, because very little sunlight penetrates. The size is about the same. And here is an example of the um, uh, Synecococcus. This may, these may be bigger. Now, you may be getting tired of these. But uh, to me, it's a great way for a retired professor to spend a few hours a day just sitting and learning things all the time with a state-of-the-art instrument. Um, so what do we have here? Just, just some examples. GISP is the uh, Green and Ice Sheet Project number two. So GISP two, GISP uh, at 80 meters depth in the ice and 19 meters depth in the ice. I'm comparing data with the opposite pole, with Seipel Dome ice at 80 meters. And to me, this is a little bit more complicated, but to me, it's really interesting that in both poles, you get roughly the same concentrations of Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus. The circles here for, for let's see, this is side scatter versus forward scatter. And if you have me theory, you ought to be able to calculate um, about what the size is. But instead, you just match them up with beads of different size, sizes. OK, uh, occasionally, at some depth, we'll discover something that doesn't fit that lovely pattern that was very sim simple. For example, here, uh, this is in uh, green ice, a little bit away from the highest elevation, at a depth of 12 meters. And now it looks as if this is the uh, noise in purple, uh, based on comparing the data with the uh, cultures. This is the uh, bona fide uh, prochlorococcus. And you've got two streams displaced from each other of red points and blue points, which I'm tentatively calling high chlorophyll synecococcus and low chlorophyll synecococcus. And then they map over here into a measure of size. So you get the idea. Uh, now, the, the third kind of cell, in addition to the cyanobacteria, which I mentioned once, are very ancient, uh, is something called Pelagibacter ubique. Ubique from, is the Latin for everywhere. Pelagibacter is even smaller than those phototrophs. It is, um, it's a complicated kind of microbe that uh, has to use both uh, uh, chemo, uh, what's the word for chemotro, um, what do you call a, a microbe that uses organic processes? Nathan, help me out. Uh, a, a chemo, uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's uh, one comma, uh, uh, it's a, a, a reaction that involves chemical species uh, in the ocean. And it also uses light. And the dye is called proteorhodopsin, which amazingly has comparable excitation spectrum and emission spectrum, which means that you can use the flow cytometer. And the problem is you can't tell whether you're seeing the pelagibacter or the prochlorococcus or not unless somebody is willing to give you a culture, and they're extremely difficult uh, organisms to culture. But I just um, got somebody who had ag uh, agreed at Oregon State University, uh, Steve Giovannoni, who discovered these uh, organisms, he, who's going to send me a culture. And this is what they look like. See, much less than a micron. They've been discovered everywhere. That's why you call them ubiquae. So it should be fun. Uh, to see if we've gotten those. Why shouldn't we? If, if they occur everywhere, and particularly right in the ocean off of Greenland and off of the, uh, uh, the peninsula in, in, uh, in Antarctica, they ought to have been carried over into the snow, and we should be able to find them. 
So now I'm coming to the end of the talk, and the, the thing that occurred to me is that one might be able to do quantitative um, evolution at the microbial scale by t going back a factor of 100 more generations than has been done in the laboratory with E. coli, or that can be done by you if you just take how long it took Homo erectus to evolve into Homo sapiens. OK, let's say half a million years, a million years, and a generation time of 25 years. The ratio of those two numbers is, the, is related to um, uh, how long it takes to produce a significant change in the genome. I mean, really significant. Homo erectus walks like this and so forth. So here's an experiment in a, in a whole bunch of Petri dishes uh, in which they followed E. coli, started off with all clones, and then separated them. So the whole room was full of covered Petri dishes. And as a function of time, they would take them out and do the genomics. Now, somebody uh, spent a lot of money on that experiment. But what they found, if you look at the bottom graph, cell volume versus the number of generations, you find that in different Petri dishes, the curves aren't exactly identical. And in fact, if you remember Stephen Jay Gould, he was the one who propounded the idea of, what do you call that? Punctuated equilibrium. OK. Um, since this paper, this guy has continued for 40,000 generations and zeroed in to little pieces of the, uh, the curve and found that, in fact, you get a step function. So it looks like it might be confirmation, uh, in the case of E. coli, of punctuated equilibrium. So here's a, a summary. Um, so they're all over the uh, ocean. No doubt, there are far more of them in the Mediterranean and in the Sargasso Sea than it, in the uh, two poles. Uh, but they make it, some small fraction of them, make it by, by uh, uh, wind. Uh, as aerosols, and then are deposited in ice. And some fraction of those, we don't know how many, live. Um, genomics is going to be very costly. There, there exists single cell genomics. And I've got enough for one experiment, enough money for one experiment. It's about $5,000 or, or more a pop. Um, if I had 10 times that much, I would be able to go back deeper and deeper into the ice to do the genomics of what I'm calling proxies. The, so the idea is what you, you want to, you, you would like to be able to take the microbes in the ocean and go back in time to see how fast um, their fitness improves and they, they turn over. You can't. You can only look at a snapshot in the 21st century. But what you can do, these have been blown from the ocean at zero degrees into ice and it's accumulating. So if you go deeper and deeper into the ice, you're looking back in time. So the idea would be to do single cell genomics uh, at many different depths. Now the problem is the first guess would be, let's assume that ice preserves them without any mutations. But uh, one paper says the um, mutation rate depends very weakly on the mass of the object but between a human and a uh, snail, it's not, not a big defendance. But there is an activation energy. Let's, let's assume that it's the same as the activation energy for the plot that uh, I showed you in about the middle of the talk where you had exponential growth of microbes and then uh, maintenance and uh, dormancy. And that bottom line there, uh, which is using Bruce Albert's uh, rule of thumb that all but about 1 in 10 to the 4, 10 to the 3, uh, of the spontaneous um, changes e either due to uh, racemization or amino a or uh, um, oh yeah D uh, DNA damage um, is repaired and so we're now having to look three orders of magnitude lower and I hope that we could uh, possibly pull this thing off if I, I won't show I won't go all the way back to the beginning uh, and show you what the, uh, the ratios are. But from ice temperature to minus 25, which is typical of Greenland ice, there's a factor of 1,000 slower rate of change, and another factor of 300 when you go down to minus 
uh, 50 at the South Pole. And so I think with those three rates uh, and doing genomics, we might be able to determine, in fact, how fast the Prochlorococcus and the Synecococcus are mutating. Thanks. A little confused about something here. Um, I don't see how these organisms can be mutating unless they're growing, and I don't see how they can be growing if they're down in ice cores where they're not getting sunlight and they're phototrophs. Is there something I'm missing here? No, no. Um, you've made an assumption which is questionable. You're assuming that they have to divide in order to mutate. Uh, the mutation is simply the failure of one of these spontaneous. Uh, defects uh, to re be repaired. And it's, it may be so inconsequential that the organism, uh, you would not, you, you'd not notice it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, does your data, <clears throat> well, what consequence does the effect of, of uh, pressure have on any of these results? Because the deeper in the ice, the higher the pressure. Right. Uh, well, they would be, if they've, we don't go down very deep. 150 meters, I think there's just not enough sunlight for, uh, they haven't found any. Oh, I meant, I meant oh, in the ice itself. In the ice itself. Good question. Don't know. No, but we know that they're able to uh, uh, metabolize and make the nitrous oxide gas and some of them to make methane. Meth uh, methane. So, at least some fraction of, you know, that's the biggest uncertainty is the, the, the methods for measuring the ratio of live to dead are still being questioned. And supposedly with two different kinds of stains, maybe even mixed together, uh, you can say, oh, this is green, therefore it's alive. This one is red, therefore it's dead. But I, I, I don't have, what I'm doing is swallowing up uh, the uncertainty in the fraction that's alive and just calling it 50-50 or you know, some number. But that, what th the error bars actually are pretty large on those um, uh, plots of metabolic rate versus uh, one over temperature. So if, if we could only get really accurate numbers, maybe uh, we could sort out the, uh, and make corrections for those and, and have a nice t a tighter curve. Yeah? Uh, Haze scattering, as I understand it, depends on index of refraction. Yes. So oh. is that, is that well, also for Rayleigh. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly this, uh, true for Rayleigh scattering, too. So if the uh, side scatter is somewhat aberrant, it may be because uh, they have a, a ripply, rugged, uh, uh, corrugated shell, which has to be a correction to the spherical assumption. Or it may be that it's um, uh, got some pigment in it that uh, uh, changes that you have to put into the calculation. Yeah. You mentioned that some of these microbes are responsible for about half the oxygen in the atmosphere. And you also mentioned that they produce methane. No, not, not the same ones. No. Not the yeah. same ones, but could any of them also eventually produce uh, organics like oil over millions of years? Um, I would think you would need a consortium. Um, that's outside of the current uh, scope is uh, I'm looking at <laughs> individuals. Actually, you, you probably read in the news that there is a, a, a new discovery that some species uh, can replace phosphorus with arsenic and can metabolize. Not, not proven. Not proven, no. I, well, this, is, uh, this was touted by the publisher, Sherry Cady. Yes, I know. <laughs> There's been a lot of criticism of that particular yeah. scientific result as not the, the, the work to prove what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, they got a lot of press. <laughs> you know, this year's press is last year's uh, retraction, but... <laughs> did, did, did you say that early on, did you say that ammonium cyanide in ice, mm -hmm. in, in distilled water... That's all it takes. Ice, and, and created what? Uh, about 11 different amino acids and at least one um, uh, purine 
uh, nucleotide. I, I, I thought you said RNA. Did you? Uh, no, the uh, to make um, not in that experiment. This guy who uh, Trinks uh, measured uh, detected as many as 420 in a chain. So that's, he's got the world's record so far. And the question is, where did the phosphorus come from? Uh, the ocean. Oh, I thought this was in pure ice. Oh, you're right. Okay. So the, where's the phosphorus? Okay, it's missing. It's missing that it's creation. Uh, th that piece. Yeah, no, the phosphate. Uh, look, we've got uh, three or four uh, essential constituents of RNA and DNA, and one of the problems was solved apparently within the last few years, as um, that had to do with ribose, which would. Um, let's see. It was th there was a barrier between how you added ribose to the nucleotide, uh, that's the sugar part. And uh, there's one guy who uh, claims that uh, he solved it. And it, I, I read his papers. I'm not a chemist, so I, I don't know. The pho but the phosphorus, y you can make pieces of RNA without the phosphate. Well, let's see, they, what are they called? Nucleo? Nucleosides. OK. Nucleosides. Yeah. No, in fact, you know, it, it's a cheat saying that uh, people have been able to synthesize synthesize uh, polymeric uh, DNA because what they do mainly is um, use analogs like imp u or, or you have the uh, u instead of something else. I'm <laughs> you've, you've gone beyond my knowledge. Okay, Buford, we have a uh a special um, memento of your talk <laughs> here uh, that contains the direct Frank, phrase. Frank, where's Frank? <laughs> so if you all join me in uh, thanking Buford for his talk. That's great. I recognize this uh, out in the corridor. Right, yeah. <laughs> I think one or two of those numbers probably has shifted a little bit, Frank. <laughs> <laughs>